Hello, this is Rainer Koschnik from Germany, and I love alternative comics. This episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by Patreon supporters like me. Enjoy the show. This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Jennifer Hayden. And welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, one of the two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this interview episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Jennifer Hayden. Her book, The Story of My Tits, just recently came out from Top Shelf. But before we get to that conversation, I want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the wonderful folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some wonderful specials. November is no exception. Sometimes those specials are at 45% off cover price. Sometimes they're 50% off cover price. But often, the discounts are more impressive than that. For instance, you can find, as usual, a good number of bundles, and this is a wonderful way for you to get a lot of comics at a cheaper discount than you would pay if you get all of them individually. For example, you can get the DC Adult Coloring Book Variant Bundle for 45% off of the cover price. You can also get the Marvel Relaunch Bundle at 50% off of the cover price. Not to be outdone, you can get the DC New Miniseries Bundle at 52% off of the cover price. And, one of my favorites, the November Vertigo New Series series bundle, which you can get for 50% off. So whether you're looking for bundles or specials on individual titles, you'll find a lot at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your comics there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. I had a nice time talking with Jennifer Hayden about her book, The Story of My Tits. In fact, I'm glad that I finally got the opportunity to talk with her. When I was at Small Press Expo a couple of months ago, I made some tentative arrangements to go by the top shelf table and talk with her briefly for the podcast. But we just couldn't get things in line because whenever I was at the table, she was either gone or talking with someone else. And whenever she was available, I was off in the convention hall doing other things. So I'm glad to finally get the opportunity to talk with Jennifer about her new book. Now, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, Andy Kunkka and I discussed the story of my tits as part of our publisher spotlight on top shelf books and we got into a really detailed conversation about the story of my tits and even though i enjoyed that conversation with andy it is extra special to be able to talk with the author of that book so let's hear what our conversation turned out to be I'm glad to have on the podcast Jennifer Hayden. Her latest book, The Story of My Tits, was released last month from Top Shelf, just in time for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Jennifer, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Now, you and I were chit-chatting before we started the recording about some of the attention that the book has been getting. So a lot of people know 
about the story of my tits. But for those who are not in the know, and by the way, shame on them because they should have listened to our Top Shelf episode from a few mm. weeks back. How, how would you describe this to those who aren't familiar with the book? Well, you know, the elevator pitch is, is it's, a, it's the story of my life and, um, and my experience with breast cancer. Uh, it's really more about my life than it is about breast cancer, but it's sort of looking at my life through the prism of that experience. But, but it's, it's more than just about your experiences with breast cancer. Yeah, I mean, the way I explain it, um, actually there's an image in the book, uh, one of the later uh, chapter headings that has a picture of the you know, the goddess image that, that evolves in the book to have some importance. And her her breasts have eyes instead of nipples on them. And um, I always think of that as being a perfect image for what the book is. It's as if I saw my life more clearly having had breast cancer, and I was looking back at it through through my breasts. Yeah. You know, I one of the things that struck me about this book, and I even noticed it when it was solicited a few months ago in, in, the, in the book's description, is that it's a different kind of graphic novel that deals with cancer. Now, you know, I immediately thought of Marissa uh, Acicello Marchetto's Mar- Mar- Cancer Vixen. And in mm-hmm. fact, we had Marissa on the podcast a few months ago ah. about yeah about her new book, and we also talked quite a bit about Cancer Vixen. Now, Cancer Vixen, is, I mean, every aspect of that book is devoted to her experiences with breast cancer. One of the things that stands out about the story of my tits is, well, yeah, you you deal a lot. In fact, the last third of the book is your confrontation, your experiences with breast cancer. But there's a lot more to it than that. Um, and, and I don't know if you agree with the way that we were kind of uh, describing the book. Yeah, that was interesting on your show. Yeah, yeah it it, it, in that uh, – you know, I kind of broke it up into, into three sections that the right. first third of the book is basically your relationship with your body, specifically your breasts, growing up. Uh, because it's not just the cancer that defined who you are but – you know, you know, what am I supposed to have as a woman growing up? Uh, you know, wh- when are they going to start showing? You know, what is this going to mean for my, you know, to me and myself, my identity, my sense of a sexual being? And then that second third is not so much about you and your relationship with your breast, but with your family and cancer. And then we get yeah. to that last third, and you know that's that's where we get to the story of you discovering that you had it, you had to have the operation, the surgery. So there's much more to this than just a cancer survivor story, which, which is which is what I really love about this book. In fact, one could even call it a larger memoir than a targeted memoir. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I wanted to jump into the computer when I was listening to your podcast about my book and um, and set you guys straight, which okay. <laughs> and what I wanted to say was, um, you know, when I, uh, it was hard to make the whole book have to do with my breasts, but the experience I wanted to give, give the reader was the same experience I had had when I got diagnosed, which was that suddenly all the things in my past that were the big stories that had to do with my relatives, um, uh, you know, my, my, the, the family I married into and my, my own family, what, I wanted the reader to have that same feeling of, oh, my God, check this out. She's getting diagnosed that her mother had breast cancer and her parents' marriage fell apart around the time. And her mother-in-law had lung cancer and no, 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 no. I didn't want to do it as flashbacks because it would have been dull to do it that way. I wanted the reader to feel the same impact I had. So when I realized I wanted to do it that way, I realized I had to put in all of that stuff in the middle um, and and flesh out all those relationships so that that part of my breast cancer, I mean, my breast cancer would not have had the significance that it, it's, it's not, a breast cancer story is not interesting, essentially, except to the person going through it, except when you look at all the lives around them and you see in, it in context. So when I started the book blithely, not knowing what I was doing, because this is my first graphic novel really ever, I 
I, it was about my breasts because that was, it was about growing a pair. And then I realized, okay, now I have to make the setting to sort of, to sort of put the stone into like a ring. And now I've got to build all the stuff around so that there, so that the reader gets that, you know, um, that same exact emotional impact that I had. And that was what the second part of the book was. I was setting that up. And I did cheap shots like, you know, somebody saying, hey, nice tits when I was getting drunk, you know, um, to, to, <laughs> to, keep the, you know like, to keep the tits rolling, you know. And I nursed my babies, and, and they were in there, you know. They're on me. They were in there. But you're right. That they were not the focus. And really, I didn't spend as much time on nursing as I had wanted to. But in the end, I thought that might also not be as universal as the other illness and marriage stories were. Um, because, you know, what you really want to be doing is raising this to the level of art. So the, the reason for the middle of the book um, being less about my uh, breast and more about all the life that, ha- that went on in that period of my life was, was as I said, to, to set things up for the reader for the, the third part of the book that was about the breast cancer. And as I said, I... I sort of wished I'd spent more time on nursing, but the, uh, the, you know, there were times when I realized this was a woman's story and times when I realized it was much more universal than that, that everybody could relate to, you know, the, the dirt that was in my family, the, the skeletons in the closet, the, the pain, the agony. It's, it, we all go through this, and, you know, that was part of why I didn't feel more private about writing about it, because I thought, this is going to help everybody who's going through this stuff. You know, yeah, and, and one of the things that strikes me that really comes out of that second part is your relationship with your now husband and uh, Jim, because it it does set his character up in such a way that it has a big impact on that last third. Yeah, yeah, and to see us go all the way through that time together, um, it makes the way we dealt with the stresses on us when I went through the breast cancer, it gives them more significance. It, it gives them more meaning, and, and you can enjoy, you know, having seen what troubles we had, you can have more fun looking at how we got through things. I have to add, everybody thinks my re- husband's real name is Jim. There are fictionalized things in the book, and one of them is his name. Mm-hmm. His real name is Steve. And in, um, in fact, um, a local reporter um, didn't ask me and assumed, you know, normally, you know, as he would, that his name was Jim, and it went in the local paper, so everybody thinks I'm sleeping with a guy named Jim now. <laughs> but um, never mind. Um, uh, the uh, I changed the names of family members, not pets, and um, <clears throat> and I also combined my brothers. I have two brothers, and I combined them into one person, because I had just too many characters. It was just getting out of hand. Um, there was just, it, both of our families are too huge, and I couldn't put them all in. Um, anyway, so, uh, so it's not, it, it was novelized a tiny bit, you know? And I was thinking of it in those terms. I was thinking of how to turn it into a book that was, um, that was as satisfying as the novels that I have read my whole life and loved, you know? Um, Charles Dickens, Nabokov, um, you know, Ghidorah Welty, uh, though it was more her short stories. Uh, you know, I, I, re- I wanted to be a writer for years, and I read so much fiction and literature. And, um, and I really wanted to construct this, not like a memoir where it's just like, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, but so that it was a dramatic uh, construct it had tragedy, it had comedy, it had suspense, it had climaxes, it had arcs, um, each chapter had an arc, you know, all the things I had learned but had not been able to do in my own writing, I wanted, I, I felt able to do in a graphic novel and I wanted to, to bring all of those um, techniques to bear on it. You know, let's talk a bit about your writing background because this is something that you mentioned several times in the new book, but this also comes up uh, occasionally in Underwire that you started off as, you know, uh, wanting to become a writer and you felt yourself, and maybe it was 
I can't remember where it was in Underwire. Was it in the afterward or someplace where you felt yourself kind of a failed writer that you called yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, so h- how did your experience as a writer, uh, failed or otherwise, uh, lead you to, you know, your work eventually, you know, to, to, let's say, activate and then to, be- to start publishing books like, you know, the resulting Underwire and then the recent one? Well, it didn't, it didn't lead to it. I mean, basically, I, having drawn when I was young and obviously had an ability for it, I turned my back on art when I went to college because I went to a college that was dreadful at teaching studio art. I majored instead in art history, and I sort of minored on my own in English and read every book I could get my hands on. And when I got out of college, I decided to become a writer. And I earned money as a public relations writer, and I wrote <clears throat> fiction. I wrote really long, impossible, horrible novels. <laughs> they never got published. I sucked so bad. And part of it was I was young, and I was insecure, and I hadn't seen much of the world, and I didn't know what I thought of life. So it was a stupid time for me to be trying to write about life. And... Uh, and I was lonely and depressed, you know, even though I was living with my husband, I didn't have very many friends at the time and I, uh, didn't, um, and I knew I was waiting for life to be kind of all around me. And that once that happened, I would know exactly that would, my voice would come out, but I was sort of in a horrible fairy tale where I was silent and I had no voice because this magic hadn't happened to me yet. I was bewitched. So, um, so when my kids were born, um, uh, I kept trying to write when my son was born. Then when my daughter came along, all I wanted to give myself as a reward for squirting her out was a rapidograph pen. <laughs> totally, totally true. And I went out and I bought a rapidograph pen and re- re- regained that, that incredible pleasure of just, uh, you know, drawing it across the page and making a black line on a Bristol, you know, pad. And, thought, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this. I explained this in the book, basically. And Mm -hmm. so the next step, I thought, because one of the things I'd always loved to draw was children, so I thought I should do children's books. And I got to children's books 25 years too late. They didn't want pen and ink anymore. They were like, are you kidding me? You have to do this in color. We now have really nice... Um, cheap color reproduction, and which wasn't around when I was growing up in the 70s. I was in love with Maurice Sendak's early pen and ink work. I always loved it more than his uh, more than his um, later watercolor, which I thought was just a total loss of his incredible talent as an ink guy. And um, and I loved um, uh, uh, the guy who did Eloise Hillary Knight and um, and Aubrey Beardsley and you know all these people. So um, so I. I I I thought I wanted to do children's books. I thought they would love the pen and ink that I did. They didn't. And I went through this horrible time of trying to figure out how to paint. And again, I had ruined another art form for myself. Yay. Way to go. So the next thing, um, so the next thing that happens is, is I get breast cancer. I was in the middle of illustrating a children's book at that time. And I had not ever heard of graphic novels. I had read comics when I was young. I'd read the Archies and Asterix and Obelix and all that. But um, and Doonesbury. But so as I'm recuperating from breast cancer, I buy a stack of books. I had read about them in the New York Times, if you can believe it. And uh, I, and I, I'm reading Linda Barry, Julie Doucet, um, Jeffrey Brown, uh, who else? Uh, Marjane Satrapi. And and I I open these books up, and my life is changed in an instant. I just said, Oh my God, where has this stuff been all my life? This is the most expressive stuff I've ever seen. I don't ever want to stop looking at this, and I have to do this. And I knew the minute I'd gone through the breast cancer and been, you know, declared clean and, and, you know, fixed, um, that I wanted to uh, talk about the experience and share it with other women who were going to go through it because I thought, well, that was really awful, but, you know, maybe I can make it better for somebody. And um, and as soon as I saw the graphic novels, I realized this is what I this is how I have to tell this story. And I just began. I mean, I spent a year reading 
the best that I could I could get my hands on. And I would seriously pick up a graphic novel and go, this is shit, throw it across the room, pick up another one, this is shit, uh, pick up another one, oh my God, this is incredible, and I'd read all of it and then read it two more times. And I studied and studied, I read all of Will Eisner's, you know, not the spirit, but, you know, his graphic novel stuff, and Mouse, and, um, you know, just every masterpiece I could find, and just internalized it, you know, what I liked, what I didn't like, what I thought was a mistake, where it slowed down, where it sped up, where it was well constructed, what had great impact, you know, blah, 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 just went through it in my mind like like an English student, you know. And then after one year went by, I said, now you go. And I started going and started this book. Hmm. So now, uh, over what period of time were you working on the story of my tits? Uh, how long did it take? Uh, from the time that you decided, as you mentioned, you know, I'm going to do this book until it got to a form where you can go, I can now get it published. Well, I just, uh, it took eight years and I sat down and started it in one year after my surgery, one year and maybe a couple months, November of 05, I sat down and I drew the first images that are still in the book. I, I threw out images if they weren't psychologically, um, on the mark if they weren't, if the emotion wasn't right in them. But I wrote this book in, in, I did it in ink, panel by panel, and I never looked back. I never rewrote, I never restructured, I never, because I had done so much of that in my writing that I knew I would never get the thing finished. I always assumed Top Shelf would ask for another draft, although I really hoped they wouldn't because I had done it in ink. But I have to do things in ink because to me, everything, the minute you do pencils, you lose the life. The life just goes right out of the picture for me. So, um, so that was eight years for all those pictures to, to get drawn. But I took breaks to do other work. I took breaks to live my life, to react to the emotions if it was too powerful. And now and then to, you know, I would throw out a picture I'd spent, you know, all day drawing because I realized the last minute, you know, that's not, that's not the right expression on his face or whatever. Hmm. Now, you know, you mentioned your, your, your style of, of creation. One of the things that Dean Hashbeel says in the introduction to Underwire is that he couldn't believe that you didn't use pencil, that you just went straight to pen. And he, I think that, that seemed to amaze him more than anything. Well, you know, he and I have such different um, uh, places that our work is coming from, really, and going to. And it isn't so unusual for someone, I don't think Linda Barry uses pencils, I never asked her. But I mean, I think there's a wild school of drawing in independent comics where it's assumed that you don't use pencils. It, you can get away with it a lot better now that there's Photoshop, because I've gotten very sneaky about making fixes in Photoshop and not sacrificing a drawing. Um, it took me years to learn that. But Dean is, he's working, he's getting paid per page for what he's turning out. He's actually making a living at this. I never made a living at this. And his, his audience expects things to look right, and people are paying him to do a professional job. So, you know, he's working under much more pressure than I am. And, uh, of course, he uses pencils because also, you know, he, he grew up in the, you know, in the tradition of the comics bullpen. And, you know, and he loves that. And that's the, the, the um, sort of romance of comics, um, you know, to the guys who've grown up with a love for superhero comics. And my attitude was very different by the time I came back to this in my adulthood. I had been burned by illustration. I'd been burned by fiction. And I was damned if I was going to be burned again. And I was going to give myself everything I needed and forget about money and forget about, uh, you know, um, deadlines and schedules and any rules at all. I didn't even read Scott McCloud's. Um, I tried to read his book about uh, comics, but I could feel that same um, sort of hand reaching out around my throat, uh, making me do things someone else's way. And I stopped reading it because I just want, I knew, I, I knew I knew what to do and I knew I needed to be free to do it. And it was a risk. I could have wasted the eight years completely, but I just had a feeling. But anyway, so I, I think that um, 
I think Dean is more impressed than he should be by that. <laughs> <laughs> because I think his work is, he also works, he does a perfect page, whereas I do one square at a time. And then I, I scan them and, and arrange them in Photoshop as a page. So I'm getting away with murder. <laughs> now, you know, your relationship, we were talking about your relationship with uh, Dean, and, you know, you are part of the Activate Online Collective. And so how, how did this relationship come about? How did you uh, get into Activate? Well, this is the whole way of how I got into comics, essentially. I had a friend in college who um, had written a memoir about the same time that I was working on my book, and we decided... Um, uh, to swap books, you know, and I, I said, well, this is not finished, but I'd love for you to see it. And she looked at it and she said, you know, I, I have a friend whose boyfriend does this and I'd love to show it to them. And Dean had a girlfriend at that time. They're not together anymore, but she looked at my first couple of chapters and said, I think this is great and showed it to Dean. And he said, this is terrific. So, um, uh, based on, that simple transaction, he invited me to join Activate, and and he, I think he wanted me to serialize the story of my tits on Activate, but I was, um, for several reasons, didn't want to do that. Um, I didn't want to put it on the web uh, and have it public because it was still such a private project, and I knew I needed, for freedom still, I needed to do it completely alone. Uh, I also was afraid, um, and people still were at that time, it's much less so now, I was afraid a publisher wouldn't take it if it had been online. So I said, how about if I come up with a new strip for Activate? And he said, fine. And I came up with Underwire, which actually was a great sort of safety valve while I was working on this book. Every time it got too heavy and dark and I was too kind of in the tunnel of my memories from the past, I could pop out and do an episode of Underwire, which was a very a much uh, more, you know, silly, shallow, not totally shallow, but, you know, as, as Simon Fraser said, it was, uh, I, I made much of nothing in Underwire. He said, I can't wait to see what you do with something when you publish your big book. And um, uh, I, I loved um, doing stories that were set in the present and that were about my current life, and that's what Underwire was. And I didn't even talk about being a cancer uh, survivor in that book. That was behind me, and it wasn't even a topic. So it was, it was and, and, and Activate gave me an identity as a cartoonist. It was just amazing to go into Brooklyn and have people say, oh, yeah, I've read your stuff. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I mean, I've been buried in New Jersey for 20 years. This is incredible. So it was, it was terrific. Hmm. So now your last um, – when was your last installment on Activate? Or, or, or maybe another way of asking that, are you active anymore on Activate? Well, Underwire became such a distraction from finishing the story of my tits that I finally pitched it as a book to Top Shelf and begged them to publish it first ahead of the story of my tits <clears throat> because then I could in all conscience stop posting it. <clears throat> and there were new ones that I made that went into the book that I never did post. At that point, I became, um, I stopped posting on Activate, but um, as I was doing the last couple of years on the story of my tits, I got the idea of doing a webcomic, a four-panel webcomic called Scrapbook, S apostrophe crap book, uh -huh. and that ended up on Activate. But it only ran for a couple of a couple of months before I realized I had to throw everything over the side in order to just do the last like year on my book. Finishing this book was like it was like um, you know you know women who go into labor and labor is only two hours and they give birth in their bathroom. And I remember when I was pregnant saying, God, I wish I could do it like that. I mean, it'd be so much easier. Right. And the, and the, uh, the Lamaze instructor said, you don't want to do it like that. It's horrible. It's much too fast. Your brain can't even deal. So when my book was, was finishing, I remember having that feeling, and I think they call it like precipitate labor or something like that. And I felt as though the book was just going faster than my brain could take it. So everything else I was doing had to just had to go. I kept, a little diary comic to, to keep track of what was happening. But I was, I mean, 
dinner went out the window, laundry went out the window, making my bed, you know, everything, everything went out the window. Right now I'm, I'm waiting to be done with my book tour and to get back to posting on activate. I want to pick up scrapbook where I left it. And I also have another longer project, which I'm not sure if I'm going to post or do privately, you know, it's another graphic novel, but um, I, I need to make my choice, but I still feel very committed to activate. And I, I, I've brought some people on board there um, that I've been just delighted to watch what they do there. And it's, it still feels like my, my club and my roots. You know, I want to come back to the story of my tits because you were saying earlier that your experience as a, a writer, maybe a failed writer, um, wasn't really what led you to becoming uh, a cartoonist or a graphic story or a comics artist. You know, but you can see your literary background, uh, your fictional narrative, uh, you know, research that you have done, the the practice, the that uh, you know failed or otherwise that you made. Because the story of my tits does come across as rather literary, and you know we were talking earlier about the way that you had structured the the book in in, in certain parts, and one kind of builds upon the other. But there's something else that I can say, if I can say this is rather novelistic about that book, and that's the way that you weave certain threads or images throughout. And one of the most striking is the poem by Sir Thomas Wyatt that mm. you first reference, I believe it's around page 49 or 50 of the book. Um, and, and it's, um, what is it, a dream that your mother has uh, when, or an experience that you felt around the time that you learned that your mother had breast cancer. And yeah. there is, and so you reference the poem and the, um, uh, there's a deer with the a sign, and the uh, on the sign is the Latin, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly. Noli me tangere, don't touch yeah. me. Yeah. And so this is an image that you bring up throughout the rest of the book, in in in, in, in not just in one way, but it, it it kind of has different permutations. And so I, I thought that that was a really insightful way of bringing a lot of these ideas together. Well, that's what I love about graphic novels, that, that you can um, you can have an idea just wander on camera and wander off camera, and the reader's going, oh, yeah, but it's no more than that. You know, it's just a, a, a hint. And maybe writers can do that, but I can't do that as a writer, but I can do it as an artist. And, you know, it's funny you bring that up because I loved using that poem. I thought it was... It's it's true that I had that daydream while my mother was telling me about her cancer, which is typical of me to just detach, detach. <laughs> um, but I I did uh, I did, and I'm surprised I remembered it after all that time. Like, you know, it, it was amazing what I had access to when I finally went into this stuff, and and how I would these things that had meant. Um, that had been almost nonsense, but had made things make sense for me as things were happening. They were retrievable. I could get back at them when I went into my memory. But that, it's funny, that particular poem, I was taken to task. I think it was the review that NPR did of my book on NPR.com, a reviewer um, uh, said, I, I think it was her, that it was a hackneyed poem, that the poem had been overused. <laughs> Overused and in this, your book, or just no, overused oh, in general? In general, I'd never seen it anywhere. I had to get my niece, who's a brilliant. Um, uh, she was just a brilliant school child, and uh, she still is brilliant. But I, I had to get her to dig the poem up for me. I remembered the image, but certainly I didn't remember the writer. And uh, and then to have this this reviewer say, well, you know, everybody everybody uses this poem. And I was like. Maybe I haven't been reading the right books. <laughs> so anyway, um, somebody blew the whistle on me on that, but I'm pretty sure nobody used it as a reference to how once cancer has touched someone, we in some way feel that we can't touch them. And that was the feeling I wanted to get across. And, and it's, a, it's, I mean, that is still how I, how I kind of visualize it. Huh. That's interesting. Now, I'm not aware of that NPR, you say, online review? 
Yes, I think it was her review. There have been many, and I could have that wrong, but I'm, I think NPR.com said something. Uh, that was her one, it was a very positive review, but her one complaint was that that's a hackneyed poem. Everyone uses it. Oh, well, you know, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I know, and I, you know, I'm someone who comes from a literature in terms of a critical approach background, and I have to say that by far that is not something that is overused. I mean, for instance, if you had made multiple references to, let's say, you know, a scarlet letter of some sort or a whale that happened to be on the albino side, perhaps. But how many people can point to this poem and say, God, not another use of this? I mean, that strikes me, uh, whoever the reviewer was, a little too precious of a thing to say. Well, yeah, I thought, well, maybe they studied metaphysical poetry in grad school and they just had a goddamn enough of it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, 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 and maybe it's just uh, hackneyed in the bubble that that reviewer is, is living in. So, uh, But I, I, didn't, I didn't think that it was problematic at all. I, I, again, I thought it was quite effective in, in pulling everything together. Well, I haven't read everything that's out there. And the thing is, when I pulled in something that was literary, because there have been – you know, phrases and things that have stuck in my head and over all the years of reading things and studying things in school, I always tried to make it accessible to the to the reader, to not use it as, a, as an exclusive, as a way to exclude the reader. Why would I want to do that? And also to make it personal. So if there was a reference that I wanted to make, but it wasn't personal, deeply personal, I wouldn't use it. So the thing about that Noli Me Tangere thing is that it's really personal, you know, um, and I hope that that's how it comes across because it, it, it's not meant, uh, it's not a use of literature as a way to, um, you know, show up what I've read or um, or uh, or cut out people who haven't read that, it's, but the opposite. It's It's, you know, it's just me swimming in all the different images available to me to make sense of life. <laughs> you know, you mentioned that your your goal was to to be very personal here, and and that's one of the the takeaways from well, not only the story of my tits, but also Underwire. And I think maybe I'm off base, but I don't know. I, I get a sense that someone reading me, anyone basically reading these books, come away with probably a pretty good sense of the kind of person that you are, because you don't seem to 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 mask or to mislead or to be abstract in any way that what we get in the story of my tits what we get in underwire is who you at least appear to be and there's something very genuine that comes out of that writing and, and I can't say that with all graphic memoirs um but but I do get that sense and, and then along with that that and I, and I hate to put it this way because they used this um, uh, in describing George W. Bush, that he's someone that you would want to sit down and have a beer with. Uh, but there's something very personable about your persona that comes out of your writing. Well, and that's that's just it. That's the leap I was able to make from writing to graphic novels. When I saw comics, uh, you know, um, autobiographical comics, indie comics, I realized that the voice – that my beer drinking voice that I was never able to feel comfortable putting down on paper just in words, it was able to come out when I w was a full-fledged character. Part of it was that I was doing autobiography, so I wasn't pretending to be anyone else. It was just me. But the other thing was that I was able to combine all at the same time the different facets of my personality, you know, Yes, I'm being facetious. Yes, I'm being silly. Yes, I'm being ironic. But now I'm going to be deep, and now I'm going to really, you know, stick it to you. Now I'm going to gross you out. You know, like I'm going to do all these things in one beer. And and it was the also that that feeling of sitting around the kitchen table and talking with women friends, which I had been doing as a mother for years, and it had become its own art form. I mean, I think conversation is is a wonderful art form, and it's being lost now largely. I mean, I, I hate going to someone's house and there's no talking happening and there's no, you know, there, there's, it's, it's a, an art that my family loved. You know, you, you sat down after dinner and you, and you talked and there were, you know, people at the table and, and, um, and the conversation, you know, went in various ways. So I think tapping into the conversational aspect of words was really important to me and only possible for me somehow in comics. 
but the other thing I love about conversation is, is as I say, this, this swirl of emotion that can happen. To me, it just can happen so much faster in, uh, you know, as you're, as you're chatting away. And so that's how I wanted to, that's just how I wanted to transmit, you know, my, my ideas, my story. That's how I wanted to do it always. And it just didn't click until I, I was doing it in comics. Well, you know, a part of this conversational tone, and I would even call it vernacular as well, is embedded in the very title itself, The Story of My Tits. Now, I'm wondering, since the book's release, and it's been getting quite a bit of attention, have you gotten much of any pushback uh, from, from you know any avenue uh, of the reading public on that title? Um, m- much more. I've had people say, oh, that's just a great title. You know, that's exactly right. And, and those tend to be women. And now and then a guy will say, well, uh, I mean, what's going on here? And I'll be like, e- read the back, read the blurb. It's not, it's not a porn, porn book, I promise you. <laughs> um, I know you'd like it to be, but it isn't. Um, and uh, the, um, the, uh, it's possible that it has kept me off things like radio, although... <laughs> You know, maybe I'm just not, you know, a radio personality that they're all just dying to um, interview. But uh, I, I think that on the air, this is going to be a deterrent, but I think I'll, I'll, I can live with that. And I'm sure it's not getting displayed uh, prominently where, you know, kids can see it. But I don't think, I don't think people are that conservative. Um, I mean, they're more conservative in America than in other countries. Um, you know, in the publishing business and in the art world. But there, it's not, I don't think the word tits is going to kill it. Um, and I thought, I thought long and hard about it. And, and when I was shopping the book to a few other places other than Top Shelf, I had some pushback and they were like, well, we might have to make that a working title and change it later. But, you know, yet another aspect of Top Shelf that I just adored was Chris just saying, well, I don't see any reason to change the title. <laughs> it just was like... Just go for it, man. Whatever. You know, this is the title. And that's how I felt. I just felt like I, I didn't want any of this to be dishonest. I just couldn't bear that. This was too important to me. And this was the honest title for this book. So I, I haven't really felt much pushback at all. Well, you know, what I was thinking about in, in asking you that is actually not so much the general media's reaction – um, but maybe more in the line of where this book may be placed in libraries. Now, it, it, it strikes me that what this book is about is perfect for libraries, you know, public and otherwise. But I could see a librarian looking at this title and even knowing the contents and having second thoughts about ordering it for their library just because of the potential issues that could arise with their patrons should they see this. And you know, maybe maybe this is too much of an assumption uh, on my part. And in fact, one of my co-hosts on the podcast is a public librarian and uh, who works in graphic novels, and I should have asked him about this. Uh, but have you, have you heard anything like that, like, like from educators that, oh, this is a great book. I'd like to use it in the library or in the classroom. However... Uh, no, I mean, when we introduced the book at BEA, Book Expo in New York, I just, librarians are a huge part of who goes to Book Expo, and they were drooling over this book. They were just coming up and buying them by the, the truckload. And <clears throat> the thing is, <clears throat> I, I really dig librarians. And I think, and the, the female librarians, sure, they look buttoned up to the average Joe, but they are not. They are cool <laughs> people. They are well-read and wide ranging in their tastes and in their understandings of the world, the ones I know, Mm -hmm. and they all just loved, I mean, Underwire was a favorite with with the librarians I knew, and then then they couldn't wait for the story of my tits, so I, and I also think they've had harder books to put on the shelf, and indie graphic novels are often towing the line between vulgarity and porn and literature, that's part of the fun. You know, it's like being in a punk band. Um, you know, it's part throwing up and part, you know, singing. Um, it, it's, there's a, um, I think they expect graphic novels to be a little bit uh, on the edge. And 
I haven't had any sense. I'm sure it, it varies from region to region of the of the United States, but um, the northeastern librarians I know have been very very receptive to it. I haven't done a tour of libraries to see who's who's got it, you know. But uh, most libraries are separating their graphic novels into the adult section and the and the uh, kids section, so they can keep things. You know, they can really keep the kids out of the stuff they shouldn't be looking at. Mm. Although I think my book is perfectly safe for kids. It's just, <laughs> I mean, as long as they know, like, where they came from and how they were nursed, nothing will shock them. <laughs> and, and that makes sense given, you know, the content of not only the story of my tits but also Underwire because one of the things that comes out in both of those texts is your very – yours and your husband's very open relationship with your children. Yeah, and and you know it's it's gone in and out of being okay. My son seems to have um, emerged unscathed from being raised by two weird parents. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, we were bound to be weird parents. My husband's a musician and composer, and you know, I was a writer and artist, and then now do comics. And we, our the point of our lives was art. It was never house and family. And so, of course, we were going to be you know odd parents. But my daughter has gone in and out as being bummed out at what I do. And and I think she's now just leads a double life and half of her heart is supporting me and proud of me and impressed and the other half of it is mortified and wishes I'd never done it and you know, wants to change her name. Um, you mean particularly this book, The Story of My Tits? Well, you know, I mean, Underwire was an easier ride and she was the star of a lot of the stories and she liked that attention and then sometimes it would make her upset because she'd say, you know, you took that story or something and you ruined it. I illustrated one that she had written and I illustrated it pretty graphically. Um, you know, it was about a made up goddess and the goddess gives birth and I had the goddess actually giving birth with the blood and everything. And Charlotte was like, that's, she was crying. You know, that's not how that story went, mom. She, she wrote it when she was, you know, eight. And uh, and I felt a little guilty. I thought, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that. But on the other hand, I, I'm here to tell the truth. At least after having had cancer, I don't plan to not tell the truth ever again. <laughs> and um, and I thought, you know, she's just got to grow. And 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 part of the problem was that I couldn't keep the work separate at at uh, in in a studio away from the house. I couldn't um, I couldn't pay for a studio if I wasn't doing children's book illustration anymore. So I moved. Um, into a bedroom at home. So, you know, she walked in, she would see what I was working on. And, you know, that was a little, you know, part of me was like, just don't look, don't look, don't look. You'll be happier if you don't look. But she always looked. <laughs> and, uh, you know, recently she said, she said, you know, that was a weird way to grow up. And, and you know, that probably wasn't a really great idea. And I just apologized and said, you know what, if you have a mother who's an artist, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, I mean, we get along beautifully, at least in that sense, it's been smooth, but um, I've been who I am out there, visible to them. The funny thing is, they didn't, my kids didn't have rough um, teenage hoods, so I think uh, everyone in the family was allowed to be themselves. There was no rebellion around this house. The parents were too busy rebelling, and um, <laughs> and the kids just were allowed to become who they were, and... I mean, unfortunately, I was also writing down about who they, how they became who they were, because I loved watching it. But um, I'm kind of about everybody getting the space they need to be who they got to be, and everybody's got to be like that in my house. Now, much of your writing uh, is autobiographic in nature, and you know, you were just mentioning your daughter's reaction to some of the ways that her or maybe her work had been represented in Underwire, and then you mentioned earlier that you kind of fictionalized some family information. Do you feel that you need to walk a fine line uh, in representing other members of your family and friends when you're doing your narrative? Well, I've I've said this before, and I don't think I came up with this. I think I heard someone say this who who did do autobiographical work. You can always set up screens um, that nobody will notice, and you can do it visually, and you can do it, you know, in what you decide to touch on, and you can just bleep over something that you feel is is too private or would give away too much about a person, and you don't want to do that to them. The the thing is to always – I've always tried to keep the story sacred. The story is uppermost 
and and what I learned that I have to impart in the story. And because of that, if you're using autobiographical material, uh, you don't have to use everything that you don't have to tell the story like a journalist would and include every ugly detail. You really can pick and choose and soften this and keep that real. And as long as the story and the spirit of the story is honest and there's a real, there's an art to that. And, and part of it is, is the art of fiction. I mean, it's funny. I worked unsuccessfully in fiction all these years, but I began to see where I could use what I learned there in autobiography to keep from dragging anybody through the mud. Yes, I'm, I am telling family stories and, and I got pretty nitty gritty in the stuff about my parents' marriage. And I felt a little guilty later because they had aged so much while I had done the book that I felt like, uh, I, I wish I hadn't been as rough on them, but I ran it by Chris Staros, who is a man, a publisher with a lot of heart. And he, he, I said, please read this and tell me if you think I need to soften things. And he said, no, I don't think you were too rough. The thing is, you got to break a few eggs to tell a good story. You cannot leave the eggs intact. You cannot scream stuff. And you see that in people beginning autobiography, you know, that they'll have like a frog and a, you know, um, bug telling the story. And you'll be like, that's your parents, right? You got to make them people, <laughs> you know, it's just not coming across the bug and the frog are not doing it. And, um, but you as the narrator and the core of the autobiography and the person who's perceiving always have to come off worse than all the other characters. That's another strong rule that I have. I will never make more fun. Autobiography is not a place to just vent spleen about what happened to you and how everyone's responsible for your shitty life. You really, you owe it to your art to, um, to be seeing clearly and, uh, and, and see your own faults almost more clearly than you see the faults of those around you. You know, you've mentioned uh, examples of autobiographic or memoir comics that you read. Um, what what about um, prose autobiography? Are there any works that you feel are classic that you are particularly drawn to, or that served as models for you in in your own autobiographic writing? You know, it's really funny, but I did not read autobiography in my 20s and 30s when I was reading a ton of literature. I would read letters that famous authors had written. I loved Virginia Woolf's letters. I think I read letters by Nabokov, a few other people, but I was reading fiction then. And the funny thing is that, you know, I mean, fiction is autobiography. You know, what really... It is the difference unless you're writing pulp fiction. So when I was, um, you know, when I was reading, and then I would read, like I loved A Movable Feast by mm-hmm. Hemingway. I loved that book. I read it so many times. That's autobiography, but it's, you know, set out in a bunch of essays that just take you back to a period of time. He's really describing a time and a place more than he's, you know, telling his story. And um, and I, as I say, I loved letters, and I, I think what it comes down to is, yeah, I was talking <clears throat> to a friend recently, um, we just both read M Train, a uh, Patty Smith book, and I, I was realizing that what I love, uh, because I loved her, her, her other book uh, more than M Train, the first one she did, Just Kids, I think it was called, um, I love it when communication has a reason to exist when when the writing is specifically written to a, a, an audience that inspires the writer to really unburden themselves and to really express something. I think that's why I love letters, and um, uh, and I'm afraid autobiography in the past seemed to me to be fake. It seemed to be uh, too much posing and too much screaming, and I read. I think I read too much. <laughs> If I read autobiography, the people were uncomfortable in some way doing it, and it just didn't come across as authentic. I read, I read diaries. I did read diaries. But it was, I was always searching for someone who could write comfortably about their 
experience and not blame themselves and not blame the people around them and just be dispassionate. And it was a rare book that, that did that. Now, are you still in the middle of your tour for the story of my tits? Uh, I have two more events this weekend. I'm flying to um, down to Miami to do the Miami book fair and I'll be on a panel there on Saturday, um, one thirty at the magic screening room. I hope it's totally magic. Um, <laughs> That's what it's Joan called, Hilton. the magic screening room. Yeah, I just like are we gonna get wings? Are we gonna fly around? I can't wait. Um and Joan Hilty is great. She's going to moderate that. And the other author is Leah Hayes. I think that's her name. She wrote a book called uh, Not Funny Ha Ha. Oh, yes. God, I should mm-hmm. be able to. Okay. And it's about abortion. So the, the, the idea is we're going to talk about the body politic, which is very interesting to me. I can't wait for that one. And then I have one more reading in Brooklyn on December 3rd with Dean Haspiel and some of the Activate crowd. Um, which is very near and dear to my heart because it brings me kind of full circle at the end of my fall of running around. And that'll be at Book Court uh, on the evening of December 3rd. I'm just checking. Um, uh, Yeah, in, in Brooklyn. And I'll be reading from... It's the only time I'll be doing a reading from The Story of My Tits or the first time. And uh, Dean Haskell will be reading from his new book, Beef with Tomato, and uh, Gregory Benton will be reading from his new book, Smoke, and then uh, the book, posthumous book, Schmuck, that Seth Kushner wrote that was illustrated by a number of different people. Um, a couple of those artists, I think, are going to read from that. Yeah, yeah, those Hang Die guys are uh, really cool. Yeah, I think they consider their Hang Die editions, you know, Dean always has a thing that he's doing as a group. Activate, he initiated with a bunch of people, and then he um, sort of left people in charge but started another thing that was in um, a cyber salon called Trip City. And that's actually where my comic scrapbook appeared uh, for a little while. And then he established Hang Die Editions, which is now a small um, publishing effort that he and Gregory Benton and... um, uh, and Seth, think, Seth Kushner Josh, and, um, and Seth Kushner, yeah. yeah, Seth Kushner, who died this uh, year, and it was really, really a loss, a huge loss to the comics group. Yeah, yeah, and in fact, we did several months ago. We did an episode devoted to Hang Die Edition. So, uh, oh, great. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, quite a bit of attention on those guys, and and you know, I got to meet finally uh, both Dean and Greg at. Uh, Small Press Expo, where I, you know, I didn't get to meet you, unfortunately. <laughs> you were too busy meeting them. That's right. Uh, and, and they're both Damn talkers. You. They're both talkers, and so they they swallowed up a lot of time. Uh, well, you know, they're never boring, though. <laughs> so, so if people wanted to find out more about your work, not just about the story of my tits, but your work as a whole, would they go to your website? Um, well, my website is sort of it's it's static because I can't update on anything on it. They, that's a, a place to start, JenniferHayden.com. Um, but as I say in the news section of my website, you've got to go to my blog to get updated. You know what's going on, and my blog is Goddess Comics with an X dot blogspot dot com, and then my diary comic posts on the Goddess Rushes dot blogspot dot com. It's called that is called Rushes, and that's the next book I want to try to publish as a companion to the story of my tits. Is this two and a half year? I've got thousands of a thousand plus pages of diary comic that I want to figure out how to how to publish, and um, and then you can people can sort of live with me as I finish the book. You know, Um, I mean, if it's of interest to anybody, but so 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 that is that uh, next book that you alluded to earlier. Uh, no, actually, because um, this this book is kind of already in the can. I fell behind a little bit, you know, because uh, we moved last year, and that's part of the story that's in it. And the moving just took days and days and days at, off of my work, so I need to, to finish it up. But that's pretty much ready to go. I just need to to see if I can seduce Top Shelf into publishing it. Um, the new project that I'm looking at is actually just a bunch of ideas on note cards in a shoebox that I need to open <laughs> on some um, fabulous day, you know, a couple of months from now, and uh, maybe not that long. Maybe I'll do it like 
right after I'm done with my tour. But um, yeah, that's the one that, that I'm going to, my next long project that I need to start. Is there anything else you can tell us about that, or is it just very preliminary, you don't want to jinx it? Um, I can just say that it hopefully will be a mix of autobiography, family um, history reaching two generations back, and fiction. And I have no idea if this is going to work. <laughs> well, did you know that the story of my tits would work? I I had a very good feeling about it, but that didn't keep me from uh, thinking many times that it was a hunk of shit. And my husband would just say, just do it. Stop talking. Just do it. Do it, do it, do it. And, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's. It, I have to say, I... It's fun to get all this attention for it because I didn't show the work to anyone the last five years I worked on it. I didn't show it to a soul. Again, love Top Shelf because they totally trusted me, and they just let me go. And I would say, boys, I've completed another 100 pages. And they'd be like, all right, let us know when you're done. And um, then after I handed it in, there was this horrible year when I, where I never heard from them because they were in negotiations with IDW and about to be acquired by them, but they couldn't say anything to me. And in the meantime, all of their lists were in, you know, uh, waiting to be approved. Um, so they couldn't, I mean, they knew that they were going to publish my book, but they couldn't really in all confidence say that for sure. So, and in the meantime, I suddenly found out we had to leave the place we'd been living in for 25 years. My husband had been there for 45 years, his old family place, and we had to dismantle it and, and find a new place to live. And that took that whole, that shit took a year. So I had a crazy year, Top Shelf had a crazy year. And then, and then it went into production as soon as we had bought our new place and moved in and Top Shelf had, had been bought by IDW. Lots of business that year. But so six years had gone by before anyone had seen this book. And I really was starting to think, wow, maybe I just really fucked it up and it's just terrible. But, you know, I'd be like washing the dishes and I'd think of a scene and think, that was good. I put that together really well. Damn it, that was good. (laughs) And so like, I kept sort of rising to my own defense at odd moments, but I couldn't get the time of day out of Top Shelf. And then in January, I'm lying in my new bed in my new house and the phone rings and Chris Starr is called up and he's like, this is a masterpiece. This is great. (laughs) I was so happy. (laughs) <laughs> well, I hope you'll have the same experiences with this new one that right now is on note cards in a shoebox. Thank you. It is going to be a trip through the wilderness in a similar way, and I am not giving it any. I'm not giving it any any rules or any weight. You know, um, I figure people can read the story of my tits for a few years. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Jennifer, I want to thank you for being on the show, and good luck with your work getting rushes out, and also be sure to tell Dean and Greg that I said hey. I will. I will. Thank you so much for talking with me. I want to thank Jennifer Hayden again for taking the time and talking with me on the Comics Alternative podcast. We had a great conversation, and I hope you guys enjoyed it as well. And if you want to find great books like The Story of My Tits, then you definitely have to go to the website of our sponsor, and that is Discount Comic Book Service. In fact, if you go to dcbservice.com right now and do a search for Story of My Tits, you'll find that you can still get it at a very good discount. 35% off of the cover price. So whether it's Jennifer's book or other comics that you would like to pre-order, you can't go wrong with Discount Comic Book Service. And if you like to use Amazon.com and get your books or other stuff there, then, well, consider doing so through our Amazon Associate account. In fact, if you go to ComicsAlternative.com slash Amazon, you will see a image that you can click on, and it'll take you over to Amazon.com. And whether you buy books, graphic novels, uh, food, clothing, it doesn't matter. Anything you get off of Amazon.com, if you get to the site through our Click-Through Associates account – 
we get a tiny kickback. So take away from Jeff Bezos and give to the Comics Alternative. In our book, that makes sense. And after you do get your comics at either DCB Service or through Amazon.com, get in touch with us and let us know the kind of stuff you're going to be reading. If you go to the website, ComicsAlternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message through SpeakPipe. It's very simple and easy to use. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us, we're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can contact me directly, I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us on Twitter, we're at the number two guys with PhDs, and we're elsewhere in the social media realm. You can find us on Facebook, on Tumblr, on Instagram, on Google+, on Pinterest, and we even have a YouTube account. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, you can stream us on Stitcher, you can also find us on TuneIn, and you can find every single one of our episodes as well as our reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's at our website, comicsalternative.com. Be sure to check back for more interesting interviews with other creators, and until then, take care.